This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 137, the eighth part of the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim series. I recently published my book, Grand Canyon Rim to Rim History, which included many newly discovered stories that I had not previously included in this podcast. In this episode, I will cover the story of the Kolb brothers, their famous studio and their contributions toward rim-to-rim travel. Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Make sure you get my book, Grand Canyon Rim-to-Rim History, on Amazon in paperback, hardback, audible, and Kindle. 260 pages packed with more than 400 historic photos to enhance your next run in the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Run, come see what this river has done. Carve the walls of Grand Canyon with the colors of the rising sun. No Grand Canyon rim-to-rim history can be complete without mentioning the Kolb brothers, who maintained a photo gallery on the South Rim for decades. The two were among the very first to accomplish double crossings of the Grand Canyon and did more exploring up Bright Angel Canyon and its side canyons than anyone of their era. They were early guides for those who wanted to cross and, knowing the canyon well, were involved in many rescues and searches for missing persons in the inner canyon. But they were best known for their daring antics to obtain spectacular photos in places others had never seen before, and they mastered the selfie 120 years ago. Ellsworth and Emery Kolb were born and grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania during the late 1800s. In 1900, at the age of 24, Ellsworth went west to see the world. First, he worked putting up telephone lines in Colorado, and then operated a snowplow at Pikes Peak. He had plans to sail to China, but went to view the Grand Canyon first and then didn't want to leave. He first got a job chopping wood at Bright Angel Hotel, and was soon promoted to a porter. After earning money for a year, in 1902 he sent money back home to bring his adventuresome younger brother, 21-year-old Emery to join him at the canyon. Emery, who had been learning photography, arrived at Williams, Arizona, 60 miles south of the South Rim, on October 10th, 1902, with only his camera, harmonica, guitar, and the clothes on his back. While waiting to catch the train to the Grand Canyon, he went into a photographic store that was up for sale. The Colt brothers saw the opportunity ahead of them, and bought the gallery for $425 on a payment plan. It was described as a little, quote, clapboard shack. They advertised to take interior photos of homes and took group photos posed against a painted scenery, but surely there were better photography opportunities. They wanted to establish a photography business at the canyon to take pictures of mule parties. In October 1903, the Kolb brothers were allowed to establish a full-time gallery at the canyon with a business arrangement between Ralph Cameron, who controlled the Bright Angel Trail and other facilities at the canyon. They initially set up a photography tent near the Cameron Hotel. Emery recalled decades later, We came to the canyon with no tent, slept on the ground in October and it was mighty cold. Our first dark room was a blanket over one of Cameron's prospect holes. We had no water to wash our pictures, all water from a muddy cow pond 11 miles out in the woods. We would wash our pictures by hand in that muddy water, give them a final wash in clear water, packed up on burrs four and a half miles out of the canyon from Indian Gardens. The brothers closed the Williams Gallery and on December 12, 1903, tore it down and shipped the lumber to the South Rim to be used by Cameron to build a barn. 
Cameron had set up a toll gate at the trailhead of Bright Angel Trail and charged one dollar to use the trail. In 1904, he allowed the Cole brothers to put up a studio next to the toll station where they could take photos of mule trains and offer them for sale. It was reported, It stands at a dizzy height, right on the edge of the precipice, and a fine view can be had from the windows on the canyon side of the building. It is to be nicely fitted up with a reception room and living rooms. There was a window in the building facing the trail. When a mule wrangler brought tourists to the trailhead, he would ring a bell on the building. One of the Kolbs would open the window and take pictures. On October 1904, Emery, aged 23, made his first trip across the canyon and back, which that year was a very rugged and difficult journey that involved swimming horses across the river. He went on a hunting trip on the North Rim with Sid Farrell and Clarence Spaulding, both employees of Cameron. The Williams newspaper joked, Some fear that they may stray too far and join the Mormons. Then we would be minus three good men. Farrell had made his first double crossing back in 1902 with James S. Murray, the first known persons to accomplish the journey back and forth before there was a trail up to the North Rim. During June 1905, Emery went on a long photography trip down into the canyon. This began nine years of detailed exploration and photography of Bright Angel Creek and side canyons. In 1906, the photography work was so intense that Ellsworth decided that he needed a long rest and went to California for a couple months. He went to view Yosemite Valley for the first time. The place was pretty deserted because of the very recent horrific San Francisco earthquake. On October 17, 1905, Emery married Blanche Minnie Bender in Prescott, Arizona. He brought her to the canyon and they moved into a tent. Blanche ran a gift shop at the Culp studio and did the bookkeeping for the business. In 1906, they built a darkroom building at Indian Garden, now called Havasupai Gardens. Most of the material for the building was brought down on burrows but large pieces needed to be hauled down on the Kolb's backs. One day, Ellsworth made three trips on foot, carrying two beams measuring 16 feet long each trip. Before water was piped to the South Rim in 1934, the Kolb's had to process the film in this darkroom. Emery recalled, For 32 years, I photographed the mule parties that left the rim each morning. Then I would run down the trail to Indian Garden to process my film, then run back up again. It took me an hour down and nearly two hours up. I once made it in 55 minutes. I loved to run. I ran everywhere. I thought nothing of running 30 miles a day. I was very proud of my legs. In September 1906, Emery led a group of hunters across the canyon to, quote, Bring in deer from the Mormons. Mayor Joe Atwood of Williams was in the group. Also that year, they made an eerie discovery above Bright Angel Creek. In one of their jaunts in 1906, the young explorers hiked the trail halfway up the granite to a turn and made a startling discovery of human remains lying on a ledge with its head resting on a rock. It appeared the men had pulled his overcoat tight around him and gone to sleep. Judging from his clothes, he was a prospector who had wandered into the canyon alone and probably became sick and died. He carried no identification, but in his pocket they found a Los Angeles newspaper dated 1900 and a pipe and a pocket knife. In December 1906, Ellsworth and Howard Noble came to Rust Camp, now present-day Phantom Ranch. Returning from a hunting and photography trip on the North Rim, Kolb took photos of the camp, and they stayed overnight. The next day, Dave Rust helped them swim their horses across the river. On June 9, 1907, Emery and Blanche had a daughter born, Edith Blanche Kolb. For years, she was the only child that lived at the canyon and was taken down into the inner canyon with her parents on a burrow with carrier boxes, one for Edith and the other for the family dog, Rags. 
a new cable tram across the Colorado River, built by Rust, became operational on September 21, 1907. The first passengers cranked over by Rust were Ellsworth, Lida Belleville, and Rose Evans, two young ladies who were working at El Tovar Hotel. They spent the afternoon playing in Bright Angel Creek. In 1909, the Kolb brothers were providing social entertainment for Canyon employees and visitors at their studio that included music, dancing, skits, and boxing. The whole affair was one of the liveliest and best ever held at this place. There is absolutely no amusement supplied by the Harvey Company or the Santa Fe Railroad for their 100 employees here, so all who attended greatly appreciated the kindness of the Cole brothers. On June 22, 1910, a rich woman, Mrs. Sargent, wife of a, quote, Eastern capitalist, was with a group on an outing on the north side of the canyon. An important telegram needed to be delivered to her. None of the employees of the Grand Canyon were willing to help. During the heat of the summer, Emery, aged 29, volunteered to deliver the telegram. He said, I will see that she gets it today. The women's traveling group had a two-day head start on him. It was reported, There were no horses fast enough for him, so he decided to make it on foot with the message pinned inside his shirt. There was no one to draw the cage across the river, so it was up to him to go overhand across the 450-foot cable on a little car. Emery went up Bright Angel Creek, fording it many times through the box, and then tackled the steep climb up to the north rim. His run set the first fastest known time, FKT, for rim-to-rim -rim travel in six and a half hours, which may have been an exaggeration. He delivered the telegram and then returned. In late 1911 and early 1912, the Cole brothers made history and became very famous by boating the Green River and Colorado River from Green River, Wyoming to Needles, California. They wanted to get into, quote, the moving picture business to record their adventure. Early in September of 1911, my brother Emery and I landed in Green River City, Wyoming, ready for our long-planned expedition. We wanted to make the big trip, as we called it, a pictorial record of the entire series of canyons on the Green and Colorado Rivers. Along the way, they became expert boatsmen. Details of their journey have been written about elsewhere and are worth reading. When they arrived at the foot of Bright Angel Trail, they paused their journey for a couple weeks to spend some time at their home on the South Rim. Continuing on, they safely arrived in Needles, California on January 18, 1912, after a journey of 101 days on the river. In May 1913, Ellsworth rode alone from Needles to the Gulf of California, completing his journey on the Colorado River. With such intense interest in their accomplishment, they put together a show with motion pictures, photographs, and exciting narrative that they wanted to charge admission to see. The motion pictures are first class. They must be seen to be appreciated. In addition to traveling to put on shows, the two brothers continued to go on adventures and run the gallery at the Bright Angel Trailhead. In September 1912, Emery nearly lost his life in the Colorado River at the bottom of the Bright Angel Trail. He was down there fishing with two others. As Emery was trying to reach the shore at Bright Angel Trail in a small boat, it got sucked down in a whirlpool. He said, Having on too many clothes and heavy boots, I was afraid to attempt swimming to the shore and exhausting myself trying to cling to the boat, which was rolling over and over. I was soon carried into the rapids below and luckily ran against a rock. The boat broke in two and went on. I remained on the rock for nine hours. Some tourists quickly headed up to the South Rim to get help. Guides from El Tovar Hotel and Ellsworth brought down rope and two life preservers. Ellsworth crossed over on the cable tram and climbed along the granite cliffs opposite Bright Angel Trail. With a rope tied to him and with two life preservers, Ellsworth floated daringly off the north shore 
reached a rock up a river from Emery and then floated a rope and life preserver to him. With the rope fastened to us, the boys on shore pulled us in. It was too dark for those on the opposite shore to see us, so we gave three cheers to let them know we were safe. Unfortunately, a rift between the two brothers came to a head during 1914. They had experienced ongoing conflicts about their business. The conflict boiled over when Ellsworth insisted that they take a lecture engagement in Ohio without the guaranteed appearance fee. Emery objected, but went along anyway in 1914, and it was a failure. They decided it was time for them to go separate ways and flip the coin to see who would stick with the Grand Canyon business. Emery won that flip. He would pay Ellsworth money each year, and the two split up territories for shoals. It has been thought that if Ellsworth would have won the flip, that the business would not have lasted, and the Kolb studio would not stand on the rim today. Even with the sibling conflict, Ellsworth would return to the canyon now and then, and still put on shows about their adventure. Emery toured the east that year, giving more than 100 shows of the Colorado River journey. He said he was, quote, well paid. In 1915, Emery made extensive improvements to the Kolb studio, adding an auditorium and additional lab and darkroom space. He put on motion picture shows and dances in the auditorium. A journalist wrote, These picture shows should be seen by every visitor at the canyon in order to get a better idea of the canyon and see the parts you could never see in any other way. The lecture is instructive and entertaining. The expanded Kolb studio and home was described as, quote, hanging onto the rim of the Grand Canyon like a nail driven sideways into a cliff. In March 1916, Emery produced an eye-popping motion picture. Above Indian Garden and the Bright Angel Trail, he scaled the battleship with a cowboy rope man, James McMurdo, to rope a bighorn mountain sheep. To prevent the animal from seeing them at a distance, it was necessary to climb directly over the peak and drop with ropes through crevices covered with snow and ice. The animal was hemmed by a tree on the edge of a blue line wall. Jimmy threw his rope, but brush and rock interfered. On the second attempt, the loop tightened over its neck. When caught, it had no fight. More than a dozen persons saw the spectacular feat through the telescopes from the rim of the canyon, and they saw that the sheep was released and uninjured by the capture. Ellsworth's quest for daring adventures got him in trouble in November 1916. He tried multiple times to run the uncharted Black Canyon of the Gunnison River. His second attempt left an injured friend in the hospital. On his third attempt, he went alone with only a few provisions and was not heard from for eight days, causing a search to be started. The next day, Emery received a telegram from Ellsworth at Montrose, Colorado that said he was fine. On May 16, 1919, two Easterners without a guide, Jay Vandebunt and Paul Betts, were trying to hike down to the cable tram. From the Tonto Trail, they went down to the river the wrong way, using an old miner's trail. With no tram in sight and no river trail built yet, they tried to make their way to the foot of the Bright Angel Trail at Pipe Creek. Betts was climbing along the wall, and Vandebunt was wading along the river and disappeared. Betts eventually climbed up to Indian Garden and asked for help. Emery and Betts searched the river for Vandebunt, but never found him, and they suspected he had fallen into the water and had been carried away. Kolb said the river was so full of sand and sediment that it would fill up the clothes of a man and keep the body from rising to the surface. After 1919, once the National Park was established, the Cole brothers rarely descended into the inner canyon on foot, as rangers took over providing trail services. Royal Thomas was from Kansas. During World War I, he trained to be a pilot in Texas and served as a lieutenant and flight instructor. Thomas's most famous stunt flight occurred at the Grand Canyon. 
On August 8, 1922, Thomas took off from Williams, Arizona, with Ellsworth as passenger and photographer. Ellsworth used his movie picture machine to record the experience and to show it in the Culp studio. With permission from the park superintendent, they flew to the South Rim and circled El Tobar Hotel several times, which created a stir. Throngs of tourists standing along the rim and others astride donkeys paused along the steep trails, all looked on in breathless astonishment. They flew around the battleship and then across the river to Bright Angel Creek. Unfortunately, Ellsworth broke the handle off of the movie camera. He kept on turning the shaft with his fingers as rapidly as possible and was surprised when the roll was developed to find that he had some very good pictures. Thomas went in for a landing on the long brushy plateau north of Indian Garden, where a landing strip was prepared and cleared by park employees. He hoped he had enough runway length. From the air it looked good, but as he approached, he had his doubts and called out to Ellsworth to undo his seatbelt in case they needed to bail out. The landing went well and the plane rolled to a stop within 100 feet of the 1500 foot chasm. Thomas boasted, This was the first landing ever made by an airplane in the Grand Canyon. The wind direction was not safe enough for takeoff, so they left the plane and started heading up Bright Angel Trail for the night. As they left, a gust of wind caught the aircraft and spun it around, breaking the tail skid and damaging a wing. Thomas did a quick repair with bailing wire and an old auto spring. The next morning, Thomas hiked back down and successfully took off and flew up to the rim. Ten days later, the Fred Harvey Company hired him to repeat the flight with a Fox News photographer riding along. The resulting film appeared in theaters across the country entitled The First Flight in the Grand Canyon. On May 3, 1928, Thomas broke Charles Lindbergh's solo flight record remaining in the air for 35 hours, 35 minutes above Curtis Field, Long Island, New York. A few days later, Thomas crashed into a golf course and died instantly at Munachi, New Jersey, while flying a speed test in the same plane that was going to make a secret flight to Rome, Italy. During 1926, Emery had land cleared off of both the South Rim and the North Rim for airplane landing fields. On the south rim, it was about four miles south of the rim and named Kolb Field. The strip on the north rim was at VT Park, near today's Kaibab Lodge, about 12 miles from the canyon. Emery said he planned to buy a plane to provide passenger transportation rim to rim. He had trouble finding a plane due to the perceived dangers involved. Within a couple years, he sold his landing strips and equipment to John Van Zant, who established the Grand Canyon Scenic Airways, Incorporated. In 1924, Ellsworth sold his remaining interest in the coal business to Emory and moved permanently to Los Angeles, California. In 1926, Emory started construction on a three-story extension of the studio hanging on the rim. Starting in the 1930s, both Kolb brothers settled down more, Ellsworth mostly in California, and Emery at the Grand Canyon, where he showed his movies, gave local lectures, and put on social events. In April 1951, Ellsworth, age 75, was hit by a car while crossing a crosswalk in Los Angeles and suffered two broken vertebrae in his neck. He recovered well, but on January 9, 1960, at the age of 83, he died in Los Angeles. He was buried in the Grand Canyon Cemetery. In 1960, Emery was recognized as being the oldest, age 79, and longest resident, 58 years, at the Grand Canyon. In 1975, at the age of 95, Emery said, Yes, uh, the canyon's really been my life's work. We started showing our pictures in the studio April 15, 1915. It's, so far as we can learn, it's the longest one-stand show in the world.
He estimated that he had photographed 1.5 million mule riders and said, quote, I guess I've taken more pictures of faces and mules than any other living man. In 1976, Emery experienced a number of heart attacks and died on December 11, 1976, at the age of 95. The studio ownership went to the National Park, which had not been keen on the building because it did not match the other architecture in the park. But an antiquities law required that any building 50 years or older had to be preserved, so it still stands today as a museum, gallery, and bookstore. More than 65,000 Kolb images are preserved at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. Ellsworth and Emery Kolb were among the greatest pioneers of the 20th century Grand Canyon and introduced its wonders to millions of people over more than 70 years. Their work has led rim-to-rim -rim hikers and runners step back in time and see the evolution of the canyon trails that we know and love today. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>